For this part, we have three items in mind. First, we want to formalize some notions from the previous part, okay, make things a little bit clearer. Then we'll note a result about the torus of a projective torque variety. Finally, we want to work our way towards convex geometry with projective torque varieties. Now, for the first part, Okay, as usual, we start with the ring of polynomials and n plus 1 variables over the complex numbers. We have the notion of a homogeneous ideal. So here we're going to take finitely many homogeneous polynomials, take the ideal generated by those. With that, we can define a projective variety. So here I'm just going to take each generator, consider its vanishing set in projective n space, and then take the intersection. From that, we can get Zariski topology on projective end space, and so on. Now, because we're talking about ideals, I could form the coordinate ring of a projective variety V. Okay, we're just going to take the polynomial ring mod the ideal. And we should note, okay, constant functions, we can think of functions, but polynomials in general, we can't think of as functions on projective space. Okay? They don't have the right transition property or they're not well-defined on lines through the origin, in general. Now, all of our items here have natural gradings. Okay, so on the polynomial ring, we have a grading by degree. That carries over to homogeneous ideals. Okay, so these are going to be graded by degree. And then, with those, we can put a grading on coordinate rings, again, by just matching up degrees. Now, Coordinate ring doesn't represent functions associated with projective space. So one way to make sense of that is to recall affine cones from the previous section. Okay, so recall, if I have a projective variety, okay, each point represents a line in affine space, so we could take the union of all those lines. And then that's going to give us an affine variety in the affine space. Okay, we'll denote that by v hat. And then the important fact is that the coordinate ring for v hat as an affine variety is precisely the same as the coordinate ring for v as a projective variety, okay, defined over here. So to see that, just note, okay, we're still using the same polynomial ring for both. The ideals are going to be precisely the same. Okay, so if I have a projective variety v, okay, if we vanish on a point, then we vanish on the entire line in the affine space because we're using homogeneous polynomials. Now, a little bit extra, okay, so for projective varieties, we also have the notion of irreducible. So same as before, V is irreducible if we can't write as a proper union of two other projective varieties. And we don't have functions on projective varieties, okay, other than the constants, if we only use polynomials. But instead, we can use rational functions, okay, and rational functions, okay, are only going to be densely defined. Okay, so they're not going to be defined at all points. So how do we get those? Well, the idea is we're just going to take rational functions as we normally would. Okay, we're going to take a polynomial over another polynomial. Here, to have these well-defined a projective space, we're going to have to use polynomials that are homogeneous of the same degree. So that way, if we multiply by a scalar, okay, what will happen? Well, since we're using the same degree, the scalar comes out to the same degree, cancels out, and then we get the same value. So these are going to be well-defined on lines. Okay, now we know they're only densely defined, so the idea is going to be that G has to be non-zero as an element in the coordinate ring. Okay, and then the domain of a rational function is going to be the variety, and then throw away the vanishing set for G. Now, let's consider the torus of a projective torque variety and its character lattice. So we have our usual setup for X sub A, I'll have T sub n equal to C star of the n. We'll pick characters m1 through ms. That's our set A. We think of these as being exponents. And we have our usual phi sub A, which is going to carry our torus into C to the s. So that just carries T, okay, a torus element, to a tuple built out of our characters. So those are just going to be the exponents. Now, if I want the character lattice for the torus for Y sub A, we're just taking the Z span of A. So all I'm doing here is, okay, we take the coordinates for phi sub a, and we can multiply and divide at will. So that's just taking the z-span of the exponents. For projective torque variety, for x sub a, 
you need to consider the relation between the torus for y sub a and the torus for x sub a. Now, torus for x sub a, we're just taking the torus for y sub a and passing the projective classes. Because the torus for y sub a has all non-zero entries, it's going to land in the torus for projective s minus 1 space, okay, defined by having all non-zero entries. We've already seen before, okay, for a character to be well-defined on lines, okay, under scalar multiplication, what I need is elements from ZA, but now I need the sum of the coefficients to be equal to zero. So that's what we're going to call Z prime of A. Now, proposition, we have our usual setup for X sub A. Z prime of A is going to be the character lattice for the torus for X sub A. And the dimension of X sub A is going to be the dimension of the small affine subspace of M sub R that contains A. Precisely, that's the rank of ZA minus 1 if Y sub A is equal to the cone over X sub A. Otherwise, it's just the rank of ZA. Okay, so the first part just follows from what we said over here. For the second part, we note, okay, if we don't have this cone condition, we can force it by adding a row of 1s to the A matrix, which is going to bump this up by a dimension. So we'll get rank of ZA. Now, for an example, okay, let's take A matrix 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 2, 2, 1. The Z span of A here, okay, of the columns, is just Z2 because we have 1, 0, and 0, 1. For Z prime of A, what we'll get is, okay, we'll have, okay, tuples A, B, where A plus B is equal to 0 mod 2. Okay, so for the picture, we're going to get the lattice where we have the open circles here. And we note here the dimension of Y sub A is equal to the dimension of X sub A because we don't have the cone condition. So that means they have the same dimension. Okay, what's happening, okay, reflected by the lattices, is that we're getting a 2 to 1 cover of the tori. Now, to move back to convex geometry, we need to consider affine pieces of a projective toric variety. So we're going to take our projective toric variety, we intersect with distinguished open subsets, that'll give us a collection of affine toric varieties that have to patch together nicely. To begin, okay, we'll define the distinguished open subset u sub i, I'll take projective space, then we throw away all points whose ith entry is equal to zero. By our usual identification, we have that u sub i is isomorphic to complex s minus 1 space, so that's our affine space, and the torus for projective space sits inside of u sub i. Okay, so recall, torus for projective space, that's all points with all non-zero entries. We have the torus for x sub a, it's just x sub a intersect the torus for projective space, so that sits inside of X sub A intersect U sub I. That's going to be our affine piece in U sub I. This turns out to be an affine toric variety. Okay, so that's just the Zariski closure of the torus for X sub A inside of U sub I. Because it's an affine toric variety, there's more data that we want to note. Now, okay, we use our usual setup. So A is given as a set of characters M1 through MS. But consider the image of phi sub A in projective space. Okay, we're taking classes of, and I have chi sub m1 on t up through chi sub ms on t. And I can divide through by chi sub mi on t, okay, where i is our fixed integer. So what we're going to get here, the mi term is going to go to a 1, and then the rest are going to be quotients of characters, which are again characters. So this is going to give me another set of characters, which I'll call a sub i. So what do we do here? We're going to throw away... Okay, the slot corresponding to m sub i, and then all other characters we subtract off an m sub i. So we're going to have set with s minus 1 characters now. Okay, proposition. We have our usual setup for x sub a, projective toric variety. We have our a sub i is defined. I have s sub i. It's going to be the affine semigroup for a sub i generated over the natural numbers. And we have our affine piece, x sub a, intersect u sub i. Okay, that's going to be isomorphic to y sub a sub i. And that's just spec of the algebra over s sub i, which we've seen before. 
Let's check for consistency among the character lattices. So we have a projective torque variety. We have an affine torque variety inside of it with the same torus. So the character lattices that come out should be exactly the same. Now for the affine torque variety, we're just going to take the z span of a sub i. For the projective torque variety, we're going to take z prime of a. And straightforward to see that these are exactly the same. So that checks out. Now let's consider patching conditions. So the idea is I want to take one of our affine pieces, intersect with another distinguished open subset, and then see what happens. So let's take x sub a intersect u sub i, and then I'm going to intersect with u sub j. So what we're doing here is taking the points of x sub a intersect u sub i, such that the jth coordinate is non-zero, or x sub j divided by x sub i is non-zero, and written as a character we have chi sub m sub j minus m sub i is non-zero as a function on the affine piece in u sub i. Okay, so this is definitely non-zero in the torus, but it might become zero when we go to the Zariski closure. To formalize things, okay, if I take x sub a intersect u sub i intersect u sub j, okay, I could write u sub i as spec of the algebra over s sub i, okay, and then to intersect with u sub j, we're just going to throw away the vanishing for the character. Now, that's going to be the same as, okay, if we take our algebra over S sub i and localize and then take spec. So with that, we're going to get the following set of inclusions. Okay, so if we start with X sub a intersect U sub i intersect U sub j contained in X sub a intersect U sub i. Okay, we have spec of the localization contained in spec of okay, the algebra over S sub i. When we go to coordinate rings, we reverse the order of the inclusion. And then this is going to correspond to an inclusion of faces and polyhedral cones that we've seen before. Okay, and then we'll say more about that in the next part. To make things less abstract, let's consider the concrete example of the rational normal curve C2. So this is projective line sitting inside the projective plane. As usual, for A matrix, we have columns 2, 0, 1, 1, and 0, 2. From that, we build our phi A out of characters, and we can restrict the distinguished open subsets. So if we restrict to U1, okay, we're going to take our A matrix and subtract first column off of the other two. So we'll have A1 equals minus 1, 1, and minus 2, 2. Affine semigroup generated by the columns is just going to be the positive multiples of minus 1, 1. So this has a single generator. We take spec, we're going to get the complex plane. For the coordinate ring, okay, so if we take the algebra over S1, what are we going to get? Well, we're just going to divide each of the coordinates by S squared, okay, and we'll throw away the one in the first coordinate. So that'll give me S over T and S over T quantity squared. So that'll be isomorphic to a C adjoint X, and we know that goes with the complex plane. If we consider lattices, all right, so for A, Okay, I'm going to take the n span of these three directions, okay, and that's how we get our P1. When I restrict, okay, I'm going to take each of these and subtract off an M1. So that's going to shift everything to the left by 2. We throw away the origin, and then we see that we're going to have, okay, well, this lattice now just has a single generator, as we've seen up here. And so we know that has to give us a complex plane. If I restrict a U2, okay, so second coordinate, in the coordinate ring, we're dividing each coordinate by S times T. Okay, so for the A2 matrix, we're going to get, okay, we're going to throw away this, the middle, subtract off a 1, 1 from each remaining column. So we have 1 minus 1, minus 1, 1. This is different. Here we see we're going to have the Z span of the column 1 minus 1. So now we're not going to get a C, but instead we're going to get a C star. Okay, so the coordinate ring is going to be given by, okay, we're taking C adjoint, an S T inverse, and an S inverse T. So our coordinate ring is isomorphic to C adjoint X and X inverse, and we know that that goes with the one-dimensional torus. Okay, again, we can take a look at lattices. All right, so we have our three generators for A. Now we're going to subtract by... 1, 1, which is going to pull everything down like this. So it's going to pull it this way. We ignore the 0, 
And then we note, okay, our A2 is going to have, okay, everything lives on a line in both directions. So that has to go with a C star, okay, one dimensional. Finally, what happens if I take okay, X sub A and then intersect with U1 and U2? Well, for the coordinate ring, okay, we'll take the algebra for S1 and then localize the character okay, given by the difference of M2 minus M1. So all we're going to do here is adjoin another character for M1 minus M2, okay, the opposite of that. And then we see here we're just going to get a C adjoint X and X inverse, and so we're getting a C star again. Okay, and so the intersection of the C, the C star is going to give us a C star. For the lattices, okay, well, we have the lattice, okay, the affine semigroup for XA intersect U1, and then when I localize, I'm just going to put in the direction for the M2 minus M1. And then that's going to give us the other direction, which goes from C to the C star. Let's compare the algebra with the geometry. So we have the rational normal curve C2. It's isomorphic to a projective line, which is a manifold is just a two sphere. If we intersect with U1, okay, we're going to get complex plane. Here we're just taking the two sphere, throwing away the point 0, 0, 1. Likewise, if we intersect with U3, we're throwing away the point 1, 0, 0. Now, if I intersect with U2, okay, we're throwing away both of these points, and then we're going to get a C star. Of course, if we intersect with U1 and U2, we're going to get a C star, which agrees with what we had before. 